computational biology at Carnegie Mellon University and also uh, in the machine learning and um, biological sciences departments there. I'm talking on behalf of my student, uh, Shengtao Wan, who was not able to come because of these issues. Um, and he did most of the work that we're talking about, I'm going to talk about. Um, the problem that we are trying to address is a, you know, a classic important problem in, in uh, network biology, which is the um, signaling network by which T cells recognize the fact that they've encountered an antigen-presenting cell that is um, presenting a, a, a signal to say, you know, I have now encountered an antigen that you should be specific to or should recognize. And this happens through a lot of molecules driven primarily um, by uh, the T cell receptor, but also by interaction uh, with the, through the so-called co-stimulation pathway involving CD28. And so our question is, how uh, do all of the proteins that are involved in, in, in active dynamics regulate each other, a problem that many, many people have studied. But we're specifically interested in the spatial aspects of this problem. Um, and so what we started with is movies collected by our collaborator, um, uh, Christoph Wolfing, um, of T cells in, that have been expressing 12 different GFP tagged proteins at different times before and after the formation of a synapse with antipresenting cells. And we had movies of about 100 cells per protein. These are different cell lines, 12 different cell lines expressing the GFP tagged uh, uh, proteins. And previously, we described a method for converting these movies to standardized maps so that you can see the, the movies themselves or frames from the movies themselves here, where you have a, a T cell that's tagged, expressing a tag protein, interacted with an antigen pre presenting cell, and then as time goes on, they form a synapse, and the protein changes. Now, what you notice is there's a lot of variation in the, uh, there's a lot of noise in the, in the signal of the, T of the T cell protein, and there's variation in cell uh, size and shape during the process. And so we described a method um, previously uh, in science signaling to, um, standardize the distributions of the proteins in the cells, which involves uh, segmenting out individual cells, aligning them coarsely, and then doing a morphing of one cell to a standardized template, which is a half ellipsoid. And so what that means is that all of the frames of all of the cells get aligned to this half ellipsoid such that we can average them all together and get an average map of the um, distribution of a particular protein um, within the cell. These are 3D uh, movies. Uh, that are, and these are, are showing examples of this for three different proteins. Um, uh, these are shown a little bit larger here. Um, and each protein is shown in a different row. Uh, and these are different slices through the 3D um, Im uh, image. Uh, and what you can see is differences in the protein distribution between two different times here. Uh, this protein, cofilin, is present at the interface. This synapse qu very quickly. Uh, myosin is much delayed in getting there. Uh, wave 2 is present uh, and stays there, whereas cofilin already starts to leave by 180 seconds. So each of the proteins have different timings with which they go through the... Um, uh, the through, uh, progress through the cell, found in different places within the cell. And so um, what we're interested in doing was to go beyond this and to try to learn relationships between the distribution of one protein at one time and another protein at a different time in the attempt to try to find changes in the distribution of protein at one time that lead to changes in the distribution of another protein at another time, okay? And so the way in which we did that is we used what are uh, generally called causal graph mo uh, process models. Uh, um, and the idea here is that we, have, we take the, the uh, distributions of proteins that we have at different times, create a graph where the nodes represent the amount of a specific protein at a specific location, and edges uh, uh, represent a possible predictive relationship between the concentration of one protein in one location and the concentration of another protein in another location. Right? So each of those, each of those nodes 
uh, we have information at various time points. So that node, um, we have data for the concentration at various times. And then what we're asking is, what's the strength of an edge between the one protein at one location and another protein at another location? Um, uh, and we want to do that. We want to infer that, uh, that graph, okay? And so you can see, uh, you know, for example, here the idea would be at this time, cofillin is high here. At a later time, myosin becomes high there. So that represents some, some kind of potential or putative causal relationship uh, in that the idea would be when one is high, the other is, is low, or when one is low, the other one's high, and so on. And that that relationship holds for all of the times that we've measured. So that's a key component, all right? Now, the first problem in doing this is that the, these maps have 6,000 voxels uh, within a cell. And that, there's no way we can make a graph that that's, that's that big. So what we do is to take each voxel and look at all of the proteins, all 12 proteins at all times, and find out voxels that have the same distribution of proteins at all times that we can therefore consider to be a, a, a given region that is uniform. All right? And it turns out that there are three regions that we find that way that are shown here, this sort of synapse region, the um, interior of the cell, and the corona of the cell as the three regions. And that corresponds to what most people working in this field would kind of think of as the, as the, the, the classic uh, breakdown of the distribution. So that's the first problem solved. The second problem is that some of the proteins, a number of the proteins, have very similar patterns. And if we try to do inference of what protein causes a change in another protein, and two proteins have the same pattern, they basically predict each other. Okay, if one starts going up and the other one's starting to go up, then they, they're correlated, so they will always predict each other in, in, in any type of inference that we try to do. So what we do there is do the straightforward thing, which is to cluster them by, again, their spatiotemporal patterns so that we remove or we, we group together all the proteins that have the same spatiotemporal pattern and then use uh, the average of all those as the representative for that group of proteins. Okay, so now we can actually get to trying to estimate the model. Um, the first approach we used was an approach developed by um, May and Moore a couple years ago. Um, and the idea here is um, to try to learn a time-independent relationship, that is a, a, a causal relationship which is true for a whole series of, of temporal data. Okay? So, for example, the example, one of the examples in their paper was to learn that you know, whenever the, it's raining in Denver, you know, two days later, it's going to be raining in Chicago. Okay? That's the, and if it's not raining, then it won't be raining. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the basic idea of, uh, of this type of process. And the way that this is, in, um, is implemented is to try to find uh, a um, matrix, an A matrix, which is the interaction, it's the edges, it's the, the adjacency matrix of the graph, um, that... Um, has values which represent the strength of that edge, and then um, some coefficients that you can multiply that matrix by in order to reconstruct the data. Now, the point here is that that A matrix is, con is, is not time varying, that is representing the potential causal relationship between any of the two nodes, um, and the way in which that it actually displays that causal relationship is reflected in the C, in the C vector, which says how you can predict one from another given the, the strength in the A matrix, okay? And so the idea is you fit the, this uh, A and C in order to minimize this residual noise. So that's one of the approaches we used. Uh, the second approach um, is a little bit different. It tries to find, um, using so-called uh, Granger causality, which is a test where you basically ask, can I better predict A if I use information on B than I could have predicted A alone from its own behavior, okay? And therefore, if that's true, if, I, if, if knowing B helps me predict A better, then we say that B is a Granger cause of A, all right? So, I'm not showing it, but we did standard analysis to show which proteins 
seem to have a Granger causality relationship with each other, uh, and then uh, um, thresholded that, um, you know, based on, um, uh, on, on a bootstrapping approach. Uh, and then those causal relationships, we asked, let's make sure those are preserved in the inference of the overall graph. Um, and we did that by, uh, by forcing them uh, in, the, in the A matrix to have a value either greater than or less than uh, some threshold, some, some constraint, um, and then just did normal uh, elastic net regression. Okay, so we're, we're asking to minimize um, this, or find, find that the A matrix that minimizes the difference between the data and the prediction of the data from the previous time points. Now, in both of these models, there is a notion that you have some maximum lag that you're allowed to look back in order to project, project the ne next point, okay? And that's this uh, M value, I didn't mention that on the last slide. Um, that is, how many previous time points are you allowed to use in order to try to predict the next time point? And in this case, we, s we chose that value as only two points uh, two time points, because there are only a total of 10 time points in the whole data set. Okay, so here is the A matrix that results from the CGP method. It's not too informative other than to realize that some of the pairs of proteins have much stronger uh, interactions, uh, such as this one here and this one here. Now, those interactions can either be positive or negative. That is, they either predict that one of them is going to go up and the other one's going to go down, or, the, or the, the predict that one goes up and the other goes up. Right? So the, the, they're basically, the, the value there is telling you the, the, the slope of that uh, relationship. And here are the matrices for the, the other method, the last method. Um, now we have a, a different matrix for each time point, but they're also showing the same thing, that there are certain hot spots where particular proteins are interacting. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you examples of some of these relationships. Um, this is showing uh, a pair of proteins where the black shows the first protein, and then what you see is there's a lag, and then the second protein goes up. So this is a particular protein in a particular uh, region. In this case, uh, both of these are in region one. Okay? So these are just illustrating different types of effects. Right? This is a case where this one goes down, and then this one's going to go up later. Um, so that's, uh, those are just selected uh, examples from, from the overall model. Now, um, what we can do with this is then look at that matrix and look at the large values, the large absolute values. Those represent strong abilities to predict one thing going up as a function of another one. Um, and we can ask in the data when those events are happening, that is, when does one change followed by the other one change, and create this type of a graph where what we're looking at is at various times as the synapse is forming, what one thing goes up, the other thing goes down, or vice versa, and you know, the, it, it predicts the, 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 the model is predicting the changes that are going to happen based on the change that happens in the cause protein. Okay, so now that's all great, but the question is, how, uh, how accurate or how useful is this particular model? All right, so the, there are three ways in which we evaluated that. The first of those is very simple, which is that we had 100 cells per protein, uh, 100 movies of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, movies of 100 cells per protein. So we took some of those movies out, trained the model with some of them, and then estimated with those that we held out. Okay, now, they're all supposed to be the same Cell, cell line, and so that's not a particularly great cross-validation because we're just taking samples of exactly the same cells, you know, and so you sort of expect that you're going to get a reasonable estimate of the error from that approach. But what we're doing there is we're building the model with a subset and then asking quantitatively how accurately does it predict the remaining, the remaining cells. Now, here's where the key comes in, I think the, the most important finding. We also had movies for cells um, uh, under different conditions where the co-stimulation through the CD28 receptor was blocked, okay? And those movies were not used to learn the model. But what we could ask is, if we take, for example, the first two time points of the blocked movie, can we use the model to predict the next time point for the blocked condition, okay? 
That is, when we block the, the activity of the CD28, that's going to affect the levels of the proteins in different regions within the cell. Can we use those changes to predict um, the distribution of the other proteins at later times? Okay? And so we can uh, you know, measure the, the, the difference between the concentrations that are actually observed and those predicted by the model. The last thing that we did is that we constructed from literature um, a, a undirected graph of pairs of proteins that were thought to be interacting. Okay, that where there was thought to be some sort of relationship between them and we asked how many of those pairs did we find as high, high values in the adjacency matrix indicating that there was a relationship between them. Okay, so those, are, those results are shown here. Uh, the most important thing is for us to look right here. Um, these are the two different methods. And so what this is saying is that we can get about a 9%, it's not, it's, you know, either 9% or 7% error in predicting by cross-validation. But here's the key. We can get 8.5% error for data that is never seen before, which is for a completely different condition where the, where the stimulation is not going to be as complete. All right? Uh, and so the, the model is basically correctly predicting the spatial distributions of the protein. So that's the key, right? It's not predicting the direct biochemical reactions. It's predicting the changes in spatial relationship that happen as a result of a change in the spatial distribution of another protein, okay? And um, overall, the, the uh, constrained elastic network regression did a little bit better in terms of that error. Um, the CGP, the causal graph process model, did a little bit better in finding the known uh, interactions um, that uh, we, we had captured uh, from literature, okay? Now, so to, to, uh, to summarize then, um, we present a different way of approaching the construction of networks uh, of interacting proteins, which emphasizes the interactions that happen spatially within the cell. Um, we found a number of, of um, relationships that were known uh, uh, interactions between proteins and actin dynamics. Critically, the model learned from normal conditions was predictive of, of the perturbed conditions, and of course, some of the um, interactions that we identify that are novel can be tested in future, future experiments by either perturbation or fluctuation analysis, okay? And uh, then I would just uh, express uh, appreciation to colleagues in both the Cell Organizer Project, which is an open source project um, that we uh, make tools like these available to the community, um, and through the uh, uh, National Center for um, uh, multi-scale modeling and biological sciences and the funding from NSF, NIH, and BBSRC. And I'll thank you there. Are there any questions? Yeah, so in this case, the limitation was we only had 12 time point, uh, 10 time points, or 12 total of which we could use 10. So we, wouldn't, we couldn't really explore that relationship. In the C and R um, method, you get different adjacency matrices, matrices for each delay. So you can do this method for you know, as, many, as, as much of a delay as you want, and you can pick out temporal specific uh, relationships. The, CGP method is sort of assuming stationality, stationality so that um, it, 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 you, know, you fix a delay and then that's, you get a model based on that delay. And it, but you can, of course, vary that and, and try to see, optimize the predictive nature of it. But that's an important question is, you know, it, it, which we intend to do. Part of the reason why these models only, ha these models only had 12 um, time points was because they relied upon human identification of the synapses and we now have a method where we can automate that so we can do, you know, a whole time series without having to, you know, do specific time points. Uh, and we should be able to get better temporal resolution. Yes? Beautiful talk. Uh, if you were to use uh, an orthogonal method, like, you know, cyclic IM, 
right, where you're actually looking at, you don't have live imaging, but you're looking at, you know, 12 of the proteins at the same time. Do you think that, you know, you could actually go from the causality to the probability of, you know, special location of co-occurrence and then just kind of use it to evaluate, you know, how this is? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, so for those of you who don't know, cyclic IF is that you can do in the same cell m multiple proteins by um, fixing and staining or, uh, you know, with different antibodies. Um, the, that requires that you have fixed cells, and so you can't look at dynamics. Um, and the advantage of this method is you can living cells tagging different proteins in each cell, but then align them temporally through the synapse formation. Okay. Now, what you could do with the, the approach that you're talking about is to do fluctuation analysis where you look and see, does this guy going up here in the same cell lead to this guy going down here, which we can only do inferentially through this approach. It's a great question. All right. Any others? All right. If not.